Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler. Our special edition game today is one from the round 11 between Giri and Hare Krishna, which was played in the 2017 Tata Chess in Vikanse on Friday 27 January. The two have met a total of 10 times and the first encounter was in this very tournament back in 2010 when they had been fighting in the challengers group. In 10 times they met, Giri and Hare Krishna won 3 games each and the remaining 4 games ended in a draw. Taking into account their historical games, this was a sign that this game was going to be tough. Giri with white expected to open with d4. Why expected? The answer is quite simple. Giri tried three times d4 and won two of them with the remaining game ending in a draw. The only time he tried e4 led to this defeat when Harry Krishna played the French and this game was in fact one of the Tata chess games dating back to 2013, a game that moved into the Blackburn defence of the Rubinstein variation and if you wonder how this exact opening goes, here it is. e4, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, d takes e4, knight takes and knight d7. Having a bitter experience against the French, Giri avoided this opening at all costs and therefore chose knight f3, a very popular choice by many players in this tournament leading to all sorts of transpositions. Knight f3 led to knight f6 and c4 moving the game into the English structure followed by c5 and knight c3 bringing the game into the symmetrical three knights variation. Harry Krishna went for the centre with d5 and after the exchange on d5 Giri went for e4 pushing the knight to b4. Naturally, you don't want the knight sitting on b4 and the first reaction is to push him away. Giri, however, chose a different approach to do this and went for something equally aggressive, bishop c4, looking at that weak f7 pawn. Harry Krishna went for the most obvious move and was determined to mess up Giri's camp. He decided to do this with knight d3 check. Should the bishop capture, the recapture by the queen will completely paralyse white and in light of this, Giri went for king e2 forcing the knight away. Though I very much expected a move like knight f4 check to squeeze the king into f1, black went for knight takes c1. After rook takes, we can do an evaluation of the carrying position. White has a number of pieces developed versus a single black pawn located on c5. The only consolation black has is that white has lost his castling privileges, but white can always get his rook out and push his king back on f1, but would need to find the right time to do this. a6 by black was a defensive move, but at the same time it prepares for a very likely b5 attack. And this is what happened. d4 led to b5 and here Giri attacked the rook. Harry Krishna had no choice and moved his rook out of the bishop's range, allowing Giri to grab the pawn on c5. Having taken the pawn on c5 was not a great deal for black, because after e6 attacking the bishop, that pawn can be taken by the bishop and at the same time strengthening black's position. So with a direct e6, a club player would retract his bishop to safety, let's say to b3, but since Anish Giri is no club player, he found the novelty and went for c6. And here we have the first real fireworks in the game. I would like to stop to explain the rationale of this ingenious move. If he takes, 
the knight can recapture and the rook needs to be given up to avoid a more unpleasant outcome. Let's come back one move to see what happens should the rook not step in. So instead of rook to c7, bishop to d6 may look like a good alternative and should this move be preferred, black will have a very difficult task of dealing with white's next move. Can you see it? Anyone? 3, 2, 1 and this is queen d4. Queen d4 forks the rook on b7 and the pawn on g7 and you can choose which to save and which to give up. I'm not sure the rook on b7 can be saved but we can consider the move of the rook back to a8. Needless to say this loses to the crushing c7 as this was the reason why the rook came out in the first place. So c7 in one word is crushing and the queen must be given up through this variation. Bishop takes and not knight takes c7 check but queen takes g7 and many pieces come off very quickly. If now the rook seeks refuge on f8 there is knight takes c7 check and white's position is so strong the knight does not even need to take on a8 as king e7 will lead to this move. Rook h d1. Bishop d7 to protect the queen does very little too late. As queen e5 check forces the bishop to step in to block the check and again the rook does not even need to take the queen if it can win the game through queen c5 check, queen d6, queen takes check, king f6, queen e5 check again, king e7 and finally queen c5 and mate with queen g5 after king f6. After bishop d6, queen d4, rook back to a8 and c7. If the queen gets to d7, I know c takes is very tempting but white has a much better move, this being queen takes g7 and black collapses immediately. You can always save the rook with rook f8 but you will not be able to save your queen after knight f6 check but you know Taking the queen, believe it or not, is not the best move and amazingly white can go for this move. Knight takes h7, need not take the queen and why should you if you can mate? King e8 is the only move to save the mate because the queen is unable to take on f8 as the bishop covers this square. You can distract the bishop with this very clever move knight e5. If the bishop takes then you have a mate on queen takes rook and the game ends. If now the queen gets in on e7 there is this magnificent variation knight of 6 check and the queen needs to go. With queen takes queen black needs to get his knight out to c6 so that white cannot get into d8 but after queen takes bishop, the knight can only delay mate with a silly move like giving a check on d4, but after king d3 and bishop g4, white has plenty of choices. He can take the knight on d4 or he can take the bishop on g4. Taking the bishop leads to the forced f6. You can take on d4. But if you try knight h6 or even c8 queen, the mate is only a step away. With rook takes and rook takes, we have king f7 and after queen f6 check and king g8, queen f8 check finishes off after king h7 and queen h6. We had come a long way to analyse this position but after c6 Harry Krishna came up with an equally intriguing move b4 but this again did not prevent 
queen d4 and move we looked at earlier. Black had one good move here and missed it. The move was queen e7, but instead he played rook c7, which let Geary to reposition his knight to a4. This is not the best square for the knight, but on this occasion, this was just the move to play. Black took on d5, and after the pawn recaptured, Harry Krishna offered the pawn on g7 through bishop e7. After the queen took, the bishop was posted on f6, not only challenging the queen, but also protecting at the same time his rook. The move led to queen h6, leaving black to check on e7. This move is just what Geary did not like, because he was hoping to get in a check first, but since this was not to be, king f1 followed, leaving the queen to take on d5. Taking on d5 was a blunder because Giri took the bishop, but this allowed the rook to become active on g8. With Giri to play, he also blunders in his next move with h3. Before we play this move, let's consider the move Giri missed. g3. Giri said he worried about a possible bishop check on h3, but... Would this have been a problem? The king is still safe on g1, though not ideal, because he renders the rook inactive. But this is not just it. The knight can now take on c6, but the queen can easily recapture, and with the queen's coming off, white is still better, and especially when his knight on a4 finds a better square to occupy. Giri, however, probably only considered the check the bishop would give on h3 and dismissed the entire variation simply because one piece holds hostage the knight, the rook and also the king. Playing h3 was quite understandable, but this gave the opportunity to Harry to chase after the queen and after locating her to f4 with the knight being threatened, Harry took on c6. The taking on c6 allowed the knight to find a more attractive square, and this square was knight c5, forcing the rook back to e7. And here white was afforded the chance to create some breathing space for his king with g3. Rook g6 was followed by king g2, and Giri was about to unleash his rook, a rook that could now find any square on the board. Harry, having realised the potential trouble the rook can create, rushed to exchange the queens, but Geary avoided this and tried queen c4. Black went for queen f6, and without hesitation, white challenged the rook on e7. Black in turn snatched the pawn on b2, allowing Geary to attack the queen with knight a4. How good was his move? And why was it played? For sure, a much better move could have been found. Knight a4 did nothing. Not only the queen can find a safe haven, but getting the knight back on a4 makes the knight extremely inactive. And this is the very moment Geary threw away all the advantage he had in this game. Instead of knight a4, queen f4 would have been much better because after bishop e6, the knight can be traded in along with the rooks. Should black take the rook with his rook, or the pawn? If you take with the rook, you're in trouble, because knight g5 creates a weakness on f7, but since black is fortunate to have his queen on a very good square, the rook can step in on f6, going after the queen. Does the white queen need to move? For sure she does. But there is no need to do this right away, because after rook e1 check, before black is able to take the queen, he would need to get out of the check. After king d8, white can go for knight f7 check, grabbing another pawn. But maybe this is not the best move around, if we consider rook d1 check, forcing the king to find c8. 
and this would have been Geary's moment. Queen g4 check adds to black's headache because that king keeps going places. From e8 he travelled to d8, c8 and now b8. But is he safer now? Let's find out. Before considering any other move, white cannot be careless. For example, if he grabs the pawn on h7, black gets his chance to mate through rook f2 check, king h1, rook h2 check, king g1, and queen g2 finishes off quite nicely. So instead of grabbing the pawn, white has two moves. He can exercise knight f3 and knight e4. Knight e4 is of course much better because he threatens the rook. Rook g6 will leave the queen to get into d7 and that king is soon gone. Queen e2 will not stop knight c5 and the game is over in a few moves with best play. We had considered the situation on this move where the rook was captured by the rook. Now we can look at what happens if we capture with a pawn. With queen e4 setting eyes on the knight, the knight's best place is to return to d8, but after rook d1, rook d7 and the exchange of rooks, the queen can come in with a check and at the same time eliminates yet another pawn. King c8 can bring the queen back to e4 and after queen takes and queen takes, black has no hope of survival. His pawns are not only isolated, but his king is out in the open and completely unprotected. Coming back to the actual game, knight a4 allowed queen a3 and that very dangerous looking knight was reduced to dust. In an attempt to reactivate him, Giri tried knight b6, but after bishop b7, it was now black who was in the driving seat. Giri tried knight d5, but Harry found an excellent move to counterattack. He did not move his e rook, but instead his g rook. Was this a bad move? No, moving his g rook was the right move, but Harry Krishna managed to move the rook to the wrong square. His move to e6 was far inferior to d6, and let's see why. If he moves the rook, to d6. Taking on e7 looks like the end for black, but surprisingly black still has a move to save the game. Anyone? 3, 2, 1, and the move is knight e5, take the knight, and black mates with queen takes f3 check, king f1, and not queen h1 check, but rook d1 check, and after rook e1 blocking the check, queen h1 check, king e2, and queen takes e1, simply mates. So, since the rook takes is not an option, what happens if white tries knight f5? Surprise, surprise, we have somewhat a unique situation on the board, with a number of pins going on from both sides. The black knight is pinned and cannot take the queen. What black can do here is to start the attack with queen takes f3, check, king f1, queen takes h1, check, king e2, bishop f3, check, king e3, queen takes e1, check, king f4, and now you can kiss that queen goodbye and the game. And this is what Harry missed by moving his rook to e6 and not to d6 because he was afraid to lose his rook on e7. Rook b6 was as bad as you can get and gave Geary a renewed hope to bring the queen into c5. Harry had enough and exchanged the rooks and for the nth time Geary could have left the rook standing on e1 because Queen d6 was what he desperately needed. Should the rook return to cover? Do you have any suggestions? 3, 
two, one. 95 is the move, and this is not just a move, but a deadly one too. If the rook takes, that is fine, because there is a nifty little mate waiting on knight c7. If knight takes on e5, there is again a mate, but this time with queen takes e7, and this is the reason why black is done. If queen takes on a2, there is knight takes c6, and if the bishop takes, we have the same mate pattern as before through queen takes e7. There is absolutely nothing black can do to save the game at this stage. I'm very surprised Geary missed queen d6. By taking the rook on e1, he also committed to a draw because queen a5 speaks for itself. But you know, Harry went greedy and arrested the pawn on a2. It is very understandable why he did this, because he wanted his pawn to walk. Missing queen a5 meant that Geary could have taken over the game with king h2 to get the king out of any discovery. f5, knight d3, queen e2, and that queen d6 again. Dare black take the knight, and the queen is lost with a discovery or knight c7 check. Harry instead can go for b3, but knight c7 check brings the king to f7, queen d5 check, and after king e7, the queen can take the pawn, and black is again in great trouble. If king d6, we have knight d5, and if queen f3, we have queen takes, queen takes, and queen takes, and black cannot survive the end game. After queen takes a6, black is the one unable to make it. Queen a5 was a much better alternative because after knight f6 check, king d8, queen f8 check, king c7, queen takes check, and king b8, both players have an equal position. Knight d7 check will lead to king a7 and white reaches a dead end to his checks. The queen cannot get to e8 with the aim to create trouble for black because black has a lovely discovery, knight e5, forcing the exchange on d7. After the king finds g1 and here is where the problem lies. With b3, queen d4 check is forced, but with king b8, queen h8 check and bishop c8, white only has queen a1 to protect the knight on e1. b takes and knight c2, the bishop can remove the h3 pawn and white will have very little to play for as queen d4, h5, king h2, bishop c8 and king g1, the situation is quite tight. Black cannot go for a trade-off as the pawns on the a-file are relatively weak as it's the pawn on the h-file. With white's two pawns standing on the black squares, it would not be very easy for black to break through and can very easily mess things up with a move like queen f5, as black can reply with queen b2 check, bishop b7, and after the queen takes on a2, the game dies down, even with the move queen h3, threatening mate on g2, because white has queen g8 check, king a7, and f3. Should the bishop take on f3, the situation looks very tricky, because black is one step away from mate on g2, but white can prevent this through knight e3, and funny enough, black cannot win. But coming back to this position, black with accurate play can win, but this is not what was played in the game. After queen takes a2, white again missed this, king h2, because after f5, knight f3, queen b2, and knight 
g5, white can still win. Black can force the queens off with queen d4. But is this move really a forcing one? No. White can go knight c7 check, king d7, and after queen takes f5 check, that white knight is immune from being taken. If he is taken, you have a nice fork and the queen is gone. If the knight is not taken, we can consider all other options. Black has three possible moves in addition to taking the knight. d8, e7 and d6. King d6 leads to mate with knight e8 check, king e7, queen e6 check and after king f8 we have knight h7 mate and what a painful way to go down and mated by a horse. If instead of king f8 the king goes to d8 we'll still have a mate with knight f7. If now king d8 we have that terrible fork again on knight e6 check and after king e7 and knight takes queen knight takes knight will leave queen e5 check and the knight is gone. The king's last option to e7 will result to queen takes h7 check, king d6, knight e8 check. If the king chooses c5, the knight will do his usual forking and grab the queen after knight e6 check. If the king chooses to land on d5, we have queen f7 check and the bishop falls with the next move. But to take the bishop will be the blunder of all blunders because the queen can take on f2 with a check and gets away with murder through a perpetual. But why should white take the bishop if he can grab the queen with a check through knight e6 to end the game sooner? For the nth time in this game, after the queen took on a2, Knight f3 was played before king h2 and this was again a move that was completely unnecessary as it allowed king d7 and it was here where Giri messed up through king h2. King h2 was played to avoid a very unpleasant discovery by the bishop should white get both his knights away from f3 and d5. Queen e2 permits knight f6 check and Harry Krishna was thinking where to place his king. From all four possible moves he had, only one wins. From king c7, king c8, king d8 and king e6, only king c8 wins. I will not go through all the variations but the winning one only. The move Harry was looking for was king c8. After king c8, queen f8 check, knight d8 to block the check, queen c5 check, black needs to find a way to stop the checks and can do this through this. Anyone? 3, 2, 1, bishop c6. White can increase the pressure on c6 and the only way to do this is knight e5 and knight e5 at the same time gets white away from any danger. If black finds queen b5, this is winning because the exchange of queens would allow the pawns to walk. If white does not take and tries queen d4, the a pawn begins to roll and after knight c4, with the aim to fork the queen, black need not worry if he can find knight b7. With a bad looking knight on f6, White must get him back. Very quickly, it would not be in his best interest to take on h7 because b3 follows and now White needs to find a way to solve the problem of the rolling pawns on the first two files. Knight f6, queen c5, queen g4 check, king c7, queen f4 check and knight d6 Black has it all under control. 
Knight e4 is white's only good response, but after bishop takes, knight takes, queen takes, queen takes f7 check, king b6, queen takes b3 check, queen e3 check, and king b7, white is busted, because he has no checks anymore. Having missed king c8, Geary found the only way to draw with a potential perpetual, and it was here where the two grandmasters agreed to share the point between them. This game had been an absolute beauty from the very start to the very end. There had been too many mistakes in the game, which also meant there had been an equal number of opportunities for both players to take advantage of. Geary was the one who got off with a promising start and got the fireworks going here on move 12 with c6, but handed over the initiative to Harry Krishna on move 20 when the game got to this stage with Geary having missed g3 to h3. Harry Krishna gaining a substantial advantage as a result in turn throws it away by missing this move. Rook d6 to rook e6 on move 29 and once again passed on the lead to Geary. But Geary for the nth time went here for knight takes e1 rather than queen d6 and who wouldn't have played this very natural and most logical move. Taking on e1 was equal to a blunder but Harry Krishna's next move matched that of Geary's by having taken on a2. It looked like a curse had fallen from above and though Geary could have regained full advantage he let his chance slip on move 33 through knight f3 as if this was all with king h2 allowing queen e2 on move 34 Harry Krishna returns from the dead only to mess it up again right after Geary's knight f6 check. If only he could find king c8, it would have been closer to a win, but this was not to be, and allowed Geary to come in with a check through knight d5 and claim a draw. In three words, what a game, or if you like in four words, what a crazy game. Both players escape punishment, and both players missed their chances. How significant was the game? Very, because as it stands, Geary ended up 8th with a total of 6.5 points, and Harry Krishna 9th with half a point less. And after having lost in his last game in another crazy game against Luke van Veli, and on this note, I would like to thank everyone who watched and participated in this clip. There is more to come and I have some other equally crazy games in the pipeline for you to enjoy shortly.